Hello, and welcome to Chapter 3, Social Responsibility and Ethics in Strategic Management. Now, in this chapter, we're going to talk about various um, ethical and social responsibility issues related to strategic management. I'm going to talk about different people who have different ideas about what this means and how co corporations can incorporate social responsibility into their strategic plans and into their um, mission statements and into their general idea of who the company is with customers and employees and society in general. So we'll talk about the concepts of sustainability, corporate performance in relationship to social responsibility, uh, shareholder analysis, why people may act or not act ethically and different views of ethics according to different approaches. Okay, so social responsibility. Um, this, you know, I think most students know what this is, but basically corporations have a responsibility to society beyond just making a profit. So previously companies were mostly viewed as an organization that followed the laws and made a profit and try to maximize profits as much as possible. However, today it's understood that customers expect that companies give back and there's a social responsibility that companies have to better society and to better um, the world that they operate in. Now, Milton Friedman had you know, some traditional views of business responsibility and in, uh, he's not the only one. Many people felt that companies were not responsible for social issues and that the primary goal of a business was to make a profit or maximize shareholders' wealth, which is the primary goal of business. However, um, many people feel that part of maximizing the profits is also being a good social citizen. But many of the early economists felt that you know, companies should maximize their profits and not spend shareholder money on social interests or social responsibility, and that if the company had extra money, they could give a dividend to shareholders, and shareholders can decide how to spend it. And if the shareholders wanted to spend it on a social responsibility, they could use their portion of the dividend to contribute to organizations. Now, Carol uh, um, had another idea. And you know, Archie Carroll came up with um, four responsibilities of a business manager in order of um, importance. So the first one of being economic responsibility. So a manager had the responsibility to um, create value within the company and produce goods and services that would maximize um, shareholder profits. So there was an economic responsibility to run the company in an appropriate manner um, so to produce a profit and uh, produce income for employees to overall better the economy and the business climate. Number two, legal responsibilities. That corporation managers had a, a responsibility that that to make actions as representing the corporation to follow government laws and to obey rules and regulations laid down by certain governments. Uh, number three, ethical responsibility, which would be to behave in a manner that was the appropriate beliefs of a particular society. Uh, so ethically, we, we all are familiar with ethics, but it's, you know, the third level responsibility of a manager to act ethically, honestly, between the company, its customers, its shareholders, and society. And the fourth is discretionary responsibilities. And these are purely voluntarily obligations a corporation assumes. Examples could be contributions um, to, to make to charities, uh, training hardcore unemployed, uh, providing daycare centers, uh, things of this nature. Okay. Now, of Carol's four, discretionary and ethical are the social responsibility aspect, and the economic and legal are more the business aspect. Now, 
if we look at the responsibilities of a business firm, we could get this idea of social capital. And social capital is basically um, sort of like goodwill of key stakeholders that could be used for a competitive advantage. Um, if a company is known to be have a lot, you know, when we say social capital, a company sort of builds up through its actions and its reputation a certain amount of capital about how um, society views them. Are they a good company that does a lot of good for people? If if they have a lot of social capital, it means that they have effectively advertised or communicated all the good things the company does, and consumers have felt that the company is valuable in its, in its efforts to give back to society. So with that being said, companies with a lot of social capital, they can now use that as a competitive advantage and get it access to communities or have an advanced reputation with customers where customers basically trust them to do the right thing. So think how powerful it is. If you if there are two companies, one that you feel is kind of shady and you would really question the quality of their fruit, food products and if you're buying them for your family and you don't really believe the company is that ethical, you know, you may, um, even if it's cheaper, you may want to buy the more expensive brand that has a more ethical code of conduct and has a more social, um, has conducted more social responsibility in its life in its corporate lifetime so that gives them these companies who have that this advantage to charge higher prices or to um, get customers to buy more or try new products with them so social capital can be a very powerful tool in generating support for the company and its products so you take a company like British Petroleum even before the accident with the oil spill, the company spent more money advertising the fact that it had research in alternative fuels and solar panels than it actually spent in 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 the research of these. So the company actually did the they did do the research, but they spent much more money advertising the fact that they were a green company, even changing their most of their colors to white and green, which symbolizes, you know, an environmentally friendly green company. So their whole image was trying to be, you know, where the environmental Mentally friendly um, company who's doing a lot of research on alternative fuels, so you should buy your gasoline from us. And if you look at what, you know, they actually spent a lot more marketing this idea than actually acting upon it because they were trying to build social capital. When you have a product like gasoline, which is a commodity, you need to differentiate yourself, and social capital is one way of doing it. But then they had a giant oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico and pretty much erased all their efforts to seem like a very socially responsible company. All right. So benefits of being socially responsible. So if you're a company and you're, you are socially responsible, like I was saying before, you get a certain amount of brand loyalty or trust that customers have for your brand and you can charge premium prices. So if people feel like, you know, if for, you know, for example, if you think of Chipotle Mexican Grill, they have a socially responsible uh, idea of how they attain their produce and their meat and the specifically how the animals are treated and, and the farms generate their products so customers are willing to pay a premium to go to that restaurant because they feel that the quality of the ingredients is high because of the level of social responsibility they take in their food chain uh, it may help to generate relationships with suppliers and distributors so you know if a company is there's this connection between being socially responsible and trustworthy so suppliers and distributors may feel more comfortable working with you as a result um, you can also attract better employees so if you give if you give someone like yourself a choice would you rather work for a company that's a defense company that's going to make bombs that kill people uh, and and also produce a lot of toxic waste that's or would you rather work for a company that actually um, not only makes a great product, but works to the betterment of society and to a better future for you and your children? You could see how people who have a choice are going to go to the companies that they could feel better about and not really wake up screaming in terror. Uh, uh, now, they could utilize the goodwill um, for support in different difficult times. So if companies really are truly loved for their amount of uh, truly um, generous social responsibility, this is something that they could use to get 
um, to cash in on that goodwill, especially with public officials to get support, you know, in economic times of economic crisis. So very useful. So you could see why being socially responsible isn't just about for companies. is isn't just about giving back just for the sake of giving back for a lot of companies. It's a strategic part of their, uh, operations of their company to make sure that they're perceived properly to continue doing business or stay competitive against other companies. So as more companies become socially responsible, it becomes very competitive and more companies are going to try to be equally or greater, greater involvement in social responsibility to maintain the upper hand in people's um, recognition of this. Okay, so we switched over to sustainability. Now, sustainability uh, has characteristics, environmental, social, and economic. Um, so sustainability includes much more than, you know, ecological concerns in the net and the environment. Uh, you know, sustainability should be thought of as economic and social as well as, you know, environmental. Uh, you know, sustainability is something I think that 10 years ago people grappled with the understanding of it. But today people, you know, pretty much understand sustainability of the natural environment um, can include social and economic aspects uh, relevant to communities and their activities, such as drinking water could be a big example of that. Uh, that's something that's an environmental issue, but it's also a community issue and a social issue. Um, a big example of sustainability is, you know, should we build a new oil pipeline? Should, you know, millions of dollars be spent on oil pipeline or should this be spent on solar farms? Um, now, since they have these are overlapping areas, sustainability, you just have to get away from the idea that sustainability is only about environmental issues. You have to remember that a lot of environmental issues like water and pollution are tied to social and economic issues. So if if you're Coca-Cola and the water is polluted, that's going to be an, a negative impact for the societies around where that water is polluted. And if you're a contributor to that, that's be a real problem. And two, the economic situation um, deteriorates greatly when water is not clean and abundant. Okay, let's talk about corporate stakeholders. Now, corporate stakeholders, um, there are, let's talk about just the stakeholders in general. So these, these are people who have an interest directly in the business and are affected by, you know, the firm's objectives. And we're going to go over who the stakeholders are in a minute. Uh, but you have the enterprise strategy, which is a strategy that hopefully articulates the firm's ethical uh, relationship with its stakeholders. So, you know, the stakeholders, the people who are tied to a company in some way, either it could be monetarily or it could be um, as a, you know, as a consumer. And the the strategy is how are we going to let all our stakeholders know about our ethic, how ethical we are and the responsibilities that we take seriously. Okay. Um, let's just go back to, okay, so let's talk about some stakeholders who could be employees, they could be uh, shareholders, uh, they could be customers, suppliers, uh, creditors even. So these are all people who have a direct um, connection to a firm and these people you know need to be need to understand what about the better they understand about the ethical policies and the ethical um, decisions and history of a company the more likely they are to either favor or not favor the company so you would want these people to favor the company so you want to be able to have a specific ethical policy and track record that you that you are not just saying it you're also doing it and that will help the stakeholders to be more connected and more um, biz, um, more likely to do business with the company okay uh, a stakeholder analysis is the process of which you know
you would identify and you would evaluate and you would um, recognize who the uh, stakeholders are. And it's done in a three-step process. Um, so, you know, a stakeholder analysis, we want to identify who the primary stakeholders are who have a direct connection to the corporation and have a sufficient bargaining power to directly affect corporate activities. Um, so, you know, we talked about the primary stakeholders, customers, employees, suppliers, creditors, um, and these are people, you know, firms, customers, you know, knowing exactly what they want is difficult. So knowing how uh, ethics and social responsibility will affect their buying behaviors is not always a clear cut uh, understanding of that. So, and it's particularly difficult when companies sell items for other companies. You know, many retail organizations, for example, will, will like Target, Walmart, will sell products made by other companies. Um, and they may have, you know, there could be a limited amount of influence. So Coca-Cola, you know, they sell syrup to the bottlers and the bottlers sell the soda. And so there could be a confusion among the stakeholders of you know who's really responsible for this product and and what level of the ethics you know falling under. Okay, so again, let's go back to the first step: is to identify the primary share of the stakeholders. And well, like we were saying, people have a direct connection to the company. The second step is to identify the secondary stakeholders and these could be local communities trade organizations competitors governments um, so they have indirect stake in the corporation but they're also affected by the corporate um, activities so these aren't people who are who are not you know they're not as close to the firm but they are they're adjacent to the firm and step three in a stakeholder analysis is to estimate the effect that each of these groups have on your strategic decisions. So when you make a strategic decision or plan, you want to look at all the primary and secondary stakeholders and see um, wh how, what effect this is going to have on them and, and what effect it's likely to have back on the corporation. So you somehow, and this is very difficult to estimate the effect on each stakeholder group, of uh, the particular st strategic plan or decisions the company is going to make. Since the primary decisions um, used by management is generally economic, the point where the secondary stakeholders may be ignored because they're less tied to the economics of the company. The primary stakeholders are, prim are the ones mostly or closely tied to the economic stake because they get a piece of it generally or either in the form of a dividend or ownership or in the form of the price of the, comp of the product being lower through better economic uh, output for customers. But the secondary stakeholders, they could be ignored in this economic decision because they're really not affected or they're not generally buying the, co the, the product or, f or working for the company or affected by the decisions directly. Um, but in order to fulfill its ethical or discretionary responsibilities, now that's when the company has to consider these secondary stakeholders in a strategic decision because if, if they are impacted negatively due to unethical or um, not or lack of spending in social areas, that may look bad for the company and then adversely affect the economics of the company. <clears throat> so called uh, stakeholder impacts and uh, input. So once the uh, stakeholder, stakeholder impacts have been identified, managers could decide whether stakeholders input should be invited into the discussion of the strategic alternatives. So a, a group is more likely to accept or even help implement a decision if it has some input in which alternative choices can, um, can be made and how it's implemented. So this is um, an interesting part because we want to look at, get some feedback, which is always good for a business to know, you know, what people think or feel or what they want. Although what's difficult for businesses, a lot of times people will say what they want you know, and, and they'll say, I want to buy a product from a company who is supporting the community and who is giving back and who is making the best ingredients. But then they say that, but they go to the store and they buy the other product because it's cheaper. But they'll never say, I want to buy a cheap product, a lower price product. You know, so sometimes people say the opposite of what they do. Um, okay, so let's look at, you know, 
the group. So a group is more likely to accept or even help implement the decision if it has um, input into which direction the company is going and how they're going to accomplish it. So if, you know, so if you're going to build um, something that's going to affect the community and you're building in an area the community is not happy about, it's best, you know, communicate with them, say, okay, if you don't want our bottling plant here, would it be okay if we put it over here? And they say, yeah, you know, especially if it's a noisy operation or something that can affect local residents or traffic or congestion, yeah, put it over here in, in this part of the community and we won't have a problem with it. But if you put it right here in the middle of all our residential houses, we may have a problem with these trucks driving in and out at 6 a.m. in the morning or, you know, things like that. So, um, these are things that companies have to think about is the respect they have for the local community and what kind of inputs they're going to give back to the local community. Okay, so let's switch gears and think about why people, why do people act unethically? And everybody has acted unethically in the past and maybe been upset about it or maybe didn't care and that's even worse. So, um, you know, in some cases, like a small child, you may be unaware that the behavior is questionable or unethical. So it could be just a matter of not being informed. So a lot of unethical behavior is because things haven't been communicated to you clearly. There could be a lack of standards of conduct, which is that there is no standard for you. You haven't, no one's illustrated or, or given you a set of standards on how to behave. Um, did, you know, different cultural norms and values, something that would be considered unethical in certain societies, such as in the United States society, it's very unethical and most people understand this, to bribe anybody to do anything for you. But in other cultures, it's a cultural norm that if you want something done in an ex, you know, or expedited, a bribe is, is a socially responsible, socially accepted method of getting that done in some cultures. Um, behavior-based or relationship-based uh, governance systems, uh, which is, you know, this is something that, give, let's give me a second to explain this. This is a rules-based or sort of what we call this relationship-based, um, you know, it's usually found within countries that tend to be less transparent and have a high degree of corruption due to uh, rule based so you know um, so rather than a lot of what is done is based on the relationships uh, between people and not so much on the specific um, laws uh, let me explain it a different way you know you may have a group of friends that you can kind of there's certain things that the greater society would find unethical, but within your relationship with, say, your closest friends, there's things you say or do that they're not going. Your inside your social group is not really considered unethical, or you know, a crude joke or a certain type of action. You know, maybe uh, just to put it, you know, maybe passing gas among your friends is something you laugh about and is not really a problem. But doing that in general. A society like in a bus or elevator or at work would be considered, you know, not necessarily unethical, but socially unwanted or un, un, um, not a cultural norm to pass gas in a public place. Um, this would be kind of funny there. And okay, lastly, dif different values between uh, business people and stakeholders. So e every person has their own set of values, and you know, this could be different among people, which could lead to different. Um, decisions ethically that people make ethically some people would feel would be fine and other people would be appalled by it um, okay so so let's let's move over to um, some some concepts that you know uh, let's see I'm trying to say let's moral relativism um, something that we're going to relate to more uh, personal, social, or cultural standards, and that there is no method for deciding whether one decision is better than another. So let's just 
talk about a few different, I mean, it's, this is sometimes, it's not that difficult of, of, a, of a concept here, but you know, it's just claiming that more, that your morals are relative to you, who you are as a person. Um, they're relative to your social group, your cultural standing, your cultural standing in the community. And there's really no method for um, saying that one person's morals are better than another person's morals. It's a very personal set of beliefs that are wrapped up in your community, your religion, your society, your 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 country's norms, and um, but you know, at one time or another, most managers have probably used one of the one of the. I'm going to talk about four types of moral relativism to help explain or justify questionable behavior. So, the naive relativ relativism is you know this is based on that all moral decisions are deeply personal and individuals you know have the right to run their own lives and and adhere to their own moral code so each person should be allowed to interpret the situation and act basically upon their beliefs or their interpretation of their beliefs and this is this is sort of thought of as, as an excuse you know that I did this because within my belief system it's okay but if the general society and the laws don't agree that's a poor excuse there could be also be role relativism and this is where you know society has different roles that have to be carried out in certain obligations that people have to adhere to so the role it's argued that you know a manager in charge of a work unit must put aside his personal beliefs uh, and instead do what the role requires and this this is something that can be very dangerous if your role if you're 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 in a role that requires you to do things that are going to harm people uh, then your personal belief should get in the way of that and you should not participate or you should really bring that situation to light so if a company is saying okay your role is to go and bury this toxic waste wherever you can so we don't have to pay for proper disposal that's something that you know, not okay. And you, sh you shouldn't, you know, hide behind a role relativism to get away with that. Okay, social group relativism. Um, this is a belief that um, a ma it's sort of a matter of following the norms of, of the individual's peer groups or social group um, and argues that decision is considered legitimate or common practice within this group but the real danger is that you know that what this just because a group does it doesn't mean it's the right thing to do for the, in in the view of the um, whole society so it may be a cultural norm within a certain group or um, to behave a certain way or do certain make certain actions uh, as part of the culture, but if it's truly not ethical or not socially responsible, then that has to be questioned and it can't be, you can't hide behind the fact that, you know, everybody in the group is doing it. Okay. Oh, I, there's one more. There's a uh, cultural relativism and this is, it's related to the social group. But if you take the social group and you make it bigger, a wider belief that that morality is relative to particular cultural cultural um, or community level at a bigger level uh, cultural relativism argue that people should should understand the practice of other societies and not judge them so if the other society routinely kills and eats uh, their own kind and cannibalism you're supposed to say well that's okay because that's their culture but no it, you know certain things that even if a whole culture does it can still be unethical or be um, counter to other customs uh, and norms of other societies so you know it's a difficult one you know it's you know, sort of like saying when in Rome do as the Romans do but it's not you know a, a, actually a lot of businesses in the US used to go to other countries and bribe 
uh, officials and to get business and put and paid a lot of money in bribes because it was okay in that country. And then in the 70s, they passed a law saying that U.S. corporations could not engage in bribing anybody anywhere in the world, you know, because they, the corporations, you say, well, it's a cultural thing that this is how you do business in this country. And the United States basically said, well, that may be a cultural thing in that country. However, it's not morally correct. It's not ethical to do that. And that was discontinued. Okay, um, Kohlberg's levels of moral development, uh, you know, there's considered three levels. You have the pre-conventional level, and this is a level characterized by the concern for self. Small children, others who have not processed or progressed beyond the stage to evaluate behaviors on the basis of social interests. So things like avoiding punishment. So this, you know, this is a very basic level of sort of... Um, making sure that it's sort of a selfish level, like you're just trying to, um, you know, your level of moral, of what's morally okay relates mostly to yourself and self-centeredness and self-preservation. Now, a conventional level, this is characterized by conditions of society's laws and norms and are justified by an external code of context. So a conventional level is that you understand what's okay within your society and you you follow those moral conventions. Then at the higher level, a personal level, and this is a level characterized by a person's adherence to an internal code of contact or an internal moral code. And the individual, so an individual at this level looks beyond the norms and laws of their general society to find a more universal um, values or, or principles or truth you know so a higher level so this is basically these three levels you could start out with just you know what you think is morally correct for yourself and then the second level would be society and the third level f would be for a higher order or higher power Okay, so if we talk about a code of ethics, this is really somebody writing down, you know, the expectations of people, how they're going to behave in a corporation or an organization. It's um, sort of a list of conduct. It's, it's a code in a way that to, in order to promote behaviors, uh, ethical behavior, it's sort of writing down the expectations of what the companies, what employees should be doing in various situations. So it's making it a little bit more clear and documented about what the um, code of ethics, um, what the ethical conduct of a particular organization is. Uh, and it's a very, it's very useful for getting people on the same page at the same ethical level. So in a code of ethics, one thing a code of ethics should do is clarify expectations of conduct of people. So giving examples or direct um, knowledge about what's okay, what's not okay. Then secondly, this it should make very clear how the company expects people to um, recognize different ethical situations, decisions, and actions. So it's not just, you know, stating the ethics is also making sure that people interpret them properly and act upon them properly. Um, now, a third thing to consider in encouraging this ethical behavior is encouraging and supporting whistleblowers. So a whistleblower is someone who sees a problem and says something. And in the past, these people would be punished by the employer by being fired or, you know, uh, being sued. And the, the, the um, many governments around the world have, especially the U.S. government, has been... Um, trying to protect these people or encourage them so that way um, you know for against for example the Sorbanes-Ossley Act that we talked about in the previous chapter for you know forbids firms from retaliating against anyone reporting any wrongdoing uh, or any misconducts so this whistleblowing is an important way of saying you know preventing a collusion internally of a corporation to do things that could harm consumers or the environment or society now giving a little bit more power for people not to be afraid to come forward and say this is what's happening at the company and it's a bad thing and hopefully bringing the government into or legal enforcement in to correct it okay so guidelines for ethical behavior for people um, you know if we think about um, ethics, um, it's a, think of it as a, a group 
uh, idea or understanding for a standard of behavior or how you occupy, how you, um, how your behavior should be within a job, a trade, a profession. Morality is sort of your own personal belief in how you should behave and usually can be at a higher standard than ethics. And then law is going to be, you know, things are going to be spelled out with consequences or enforcement if certain moral um, behaviors are not followed. So a more strict approach. Now, if, if we look at, you know, the interpretation of these approaches, you can have a utilitarian approach, uh, which proposes that actions and plans should be judged by their consequences. So people, therefore, behave in a way that will produce the greatest benefit to society and produce the least harm to people at the lowest costs. Uh, and generally, the problem with this approach is the difficulty to recognize, you know, recognizing all the beliefs and costs of any particular decision. You know, individual rights approach, and this approach looks at human beings as having a certain fundamental rights that should be respected above all of the decisions. And a particular decision or behavior should be avoided if it interferes with the rights of other people. So, you know, there are fundamental rights that we have as citizens, and, you know, the U.S. has a good example of their Bill of Rights, which sort of outlines the rights that people have. And it's unethical to really you do anything that's going to um, limit people's activities in this rights. In the justice approach, here we're um, looking to make equitable and fair and impartial um, decisions in the distribution and cost of benefits to individuals and groups, and it follows a principle of distributive justice. So, um, so for example, that you know, it's just it's just basically a code of fairness, so that things should be done in an equal way to people or in a fair way. So concepts of how things get reimbursed or justice gets dispensed should be in a non-discriminatory, uh, equal and fair distribution of how it's, the, it's applied to society. Okay, so there are these um, three questions to solve unethical problems. So the first question is utility. Does it optimize the satisfaction of the shareholders or stakeholders? Um, meaning, does this decision, is it the best decision for the, sta the stakeholders? Two, rights. Does it respect all the rights of the individuals involved? So is this decision not only best for the shareholders, but is it also best for all the rights of the individuals involved that's going to be affected by this decision? And three, justice. Is it consistent with the law? Is this decision going to be legal? And is this, this, this decision, so some decisions may be, you know, the right decision and be the best for the company, but just not legal. So if it's not legal, even though it may be satisfy one and two, it's not going to be a good solution. So for a good solution it has to be good for the company, good for all the people involved in the company, uh, not just people who profit from the company, and follow the correct legal guidelines. Okay, so um, so there is a philosophy, and so we call this, you know, guidelines, and inside the guidelines of ethical behavior, there's this philosophy of categorical imperatives. So actions are ethical only if the person is willing for the same action to be taken by everyone in a similar situation. So basically, you know, whatever whatever th you think is fair is is something other people view as fair as well, or is, is something that you're willing to accept the consequences of it too. So if you say, I think it's fair that you can execute someone if they kill somebody else, then if you're in that situation, you have to think it's fair for yourself as well as other people. Oops. Just ignore that. Um, never treat another person simply as uh, a means, but always as an end. So meaning that you don't treat another person in a particular way um, or an action you know, that is morally wrong for the person if that person uses others merely as a means for advancing his or her own interests. So you don't create a situation where you're applying, you know, a moral judgment or an ethical judgment on someone for your own profit. Um, so 
the action not restrict other people's actions so that they are disadvantaged in some way. So it's basically the you know these imperatives are you know do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, and then you know don't take you don't utilize the the idea of this ethics to take advantage of a situation for your betterment. You know, sort of how these two kind of imperatives lay out. Okay, so that's that's the basic chapter on social responsibility and ethics. And this is chapter three. I look forward to talking to you in chapter four.